Welcome into a Friday edition of In Touch with Indiana Sports, powered by HoosierIllustrated.com. Congratulations, you made it to the end of another work week. If you are indeed somebody who works your typical Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Or maybe you're like me, and sometimes you work on the weekends. But sometimes that can be fun, depending on what your job is. Like, you know, if you're doing games like myself, that can be fun, of course. But I'm, I'm assuming most of you are not doing that and are glad to be at the weekend. So welcome in. Welcome to, to the Friday edition of In Touch with Indiana Sports. Got a lot to get into today. Going to talk with Drew Rosenberg a little bit later to do a little NBA primer. And I know the NBA is already a couple of days into the season. But Drew and I were talking a few days ago. And we don't really have any NBA presence on the show right now. And he's somebody who's going to help us fill that void at least for the time being. And not that it would, uh, that sounded probably like a bad thing. He did a really good job and I'm looking forward to sharing the segment with you. But we may we may bring in some others, uh, as I've mentioned, like Tyler Smith before to talk specifically about the Pacers. But Drew really knows his stuff when it comes to all things NBA. So he'll be our kind of all around guy when it comes to go, you know, talking about the NBA and that type of stuff. So we'll uh, hopefully you guys enjoy that. We'll get that here in a little bit. But we also got a lot of, other things to talk about and unfortunately i'm going to start off with a couple of pieces of some some somber news and there is a chance that many of you especially if you're a college basketball fan saw this yesterday evening and that is that former south florida head coach as well as former kennesaw state head coach uh, amir abdur rahim passed away last night at the age of 43 uh, he had an undisclosed illness, and he he passed away. There were some complications during a medical procedure, I believe I read about, and um, he just unfortunate situation. And it's really sad. He was a very he was very much a rising star when it came to the college basketball head coaching ranks, and he took a Kennesaw State team that was in his first year they were one in twenty eight. And then by year four, he had them 26 and nine. And then, and then, excuse me, and in the NCAA tournament. And then in his first season in South Florida, he had them 25 and eight, and they went to the NIT second round. So uh, condolences to uh, his family and his friends, and of course, to all of his players uh, who are deeply affected by this. Just ne- it's never good news when somebody passes away. Uh, early or late. I mean, really in general, obviously death is a very sad thing, but when it comes uh, at this point in somebody's life, there's an added level of, uh, you know, sadness that comes along with it. So again, condolences and thoughts and prayers to Amir Abdul Rahim's family. And one more piece of, uh, of, of news along the same lines. And this is in the IU camp, former Indiana football quarterback, Tim Clifford passed away yesterday. Uh, he was 65 years old, or excuse me, this was two days ago. He was 65 years old, and back when he played for Indiana from 1977 to 1980, he was the Big Ten most valuable player. So, uh, big shout out to him and his accomplishments. But again, unfortunate that he is no longer with us. And condolences to the Clifford family and friends, and all those who were deeply affected by his passing. Uh, so I hate to get off or Friday on such a somber note, but I didn't want to ignore those things. And I knew the uh, Amir Abdul Rahim news really kind of rocked the college f- or b- basketball landscape last night. And uh, it was very, it's very surprising when you find out anybody, you know, just, you know, dies as a middle-aged human being. And it's just, it's very, it's, I hate to say it's scary because I mean, death is inevitable. You don't want to be afraid of it, but you know, nobody wants to to go before they think it's their time. So I'll just leave it at that. Don't want to dwell too much on all of that stuff. But again, one more time, condolences to both Abdul Rahim's family and, of course, Tim Clifford's family as well. Uh, and then what, but this is you know kind of beginning the uptick of, of some better news, right? I mean, unfortunately, Bob Knight is no longer with us. He passed away, I believe it was earlier this year. I don't remember the exact date, but I remember covering it on the former on the show that I used to be a part of. But today would have been Bob Knight's 84th birthday. So I guess happy heavenly birthday to to one Robert Montgomery Knight, the the former general of Indiana Hoosiers men's basketball. With that being said, let's get into the good stuff. Let's get into some more exciting things because 
this is another big week for Indiana athletics and uh, the football program. The men's basketball program gets to face Tennessee in a charity exhibition this Sunday. And there's just a lot going on. College game days in town. And we learned yesterday that the guest picker for this weekend's edition of College Game Day is going to be none other than Kyle Schwarber, the former Indiana baseball superstar who helped lead the Hoosiers when Tracy Smith was the head coach, leading them to their first and currently only college world series appearance I'm not, for, for some reason now that i say that i feel like i'm i'm incorrect on that so i do want to fact check myself live here on the air and i feel like i'm i'm right when i say it is because i know they've had some really good teams in the past that have come really close and i do know there were there were a couple in, instances where they were you know were nearly did it for a second time and uh yeah, I was correct. 2013. Anytime I say something like that, I always get in my head like, is this really the only time? Like, I, I didn't want to misspeak in somebody. I'm always afraid of being corrected in the comments. And I don't mind being corrected, but I'd rather avoid it. You know, you know, I don't want to come across, I guess, as, you know, not doing my homework, right? Nobody wants to be like that. So I take another sip of coffee. But yeah, Kyle Schwarber was a very pivotal a player on a, one of Indiana's best, really, you could say their best team of all time based on postseason and, you know, getting to a certain point in the College World Series. Not only that, though, he is a MLB World Series champion with the Chicago, with the Chicago Cubs. For those who paid attention back in whenever that run happened, you know, the historic run to end the Cubs curse. I mean, that was something. I've never been a huge baseball guy, especially with, with the MLB. But there was something fun whenever you, whenever, since I was somebody who grew up watching Kyle Schwarber with Indiana baseball, whenever he made that jump up from the Arizona Fall League during that point in the season and really sparked the Cubs during their, their World Series run, you know, hitting big home run after big home run when being called up, that was something. You know, to, you felt like a Cubs fan. And I know that that kind of sounds fraudulent. If you're a Cubs fan and you're listening, I, I totally understand if you think that is not being a Cubs fan because it really isn't. But you felt like a Cubs fan because you were you had that. If you're an Indiana guy or or gal, you had that connection. Like, wow, this is this is history of the making, and you have you know a at least a, a connection when it comes to your your fandom to somebody who's being a major part of that. And so seeing Kyle Schwarber do what he did with the Chicago Cubs and help lead them to their first World Series in, what was it, over 100 years? I don't remember the exact time, but I know that that was one of the biggest, you know, professional sports curses out there before it was finally broken. So it'll be a pleasure to see him on ESPN's College Game Day as the Hoosiers guest picker. And I will say this. I'll say a couple things. First of all, before I made the Trace Jackson Davis connection with with Taven Jackson, of course, I initially was like, don't go the basketball route when it comes to having a guest picker. It seems like a cop out. It seems like you're really just leaning into the basketball school over football school thing. I wasn't about that. But I would have been okay with it being Trace Jackson Davis for the simple fact of Taven Jackson being the starting quarterback this week. And Trace Jackson, is a, Trace Jackson Davis is a good, uh, he's a good guy behind the microphone anyway. So it wouldn't have been a terrible pick regardless. But I was happy to see game day go a different route than just picking a former basketball superstar for Indiana because that just kind of opens, you know, the door for people to say, oh, basketball over football. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping, I'm glad we're, I've said this before already. I am glad that we are in a point in time, I guess point in history, whatever you want to call it, where right now, and this probably won't last. I mean, it depends on if Indiana continues to to win at the high level that they're winning, but I love seeing Indiana football take precedent over Indiana basketball right now. And that's not a knock on Indiana basketball. I mean, it may sound like it. it's not meant to be, but to see football finally get their true due. And, and, and again, when they suck, they don't deserve the due. So I, I get it. Like when things are going well, 
are not going well, it, it totally makes sense to tune them out and not, uh, you know, necessarily be too concerned about what they're doing on the field. But now that they are, they have a legitimate, they have a legitimate chance to do things that they've never done before. And they've already done that with a lot of stuff. I mean, they're, they're two wins away from having their best start to a season of all time. Of course, a win this weekend will tie that back with their 67 season that got them all the way to the Rose Bowl. But they have a chance to do a bunch of historic things uh, for the remainder of the year, and I hope that ride continues uh, with the way they put in a performance against Washington this Saturday. So we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see. And keeping you uh, keeping you covered this weekend when it comes to the football postgame wrap-up show will once again be Drew Rosenberg and – HoosierIllustrated.com's Dylan Traeger will be alongside with him to give you your recap on everything that goes down when it comes to this weekend's events between Indiana and Washington. And hopefully they have some good news to talk about during that time frame. I really hope this is the last one I have to miss. It's the last one I have to miss for personal reasons. I believe I mentioned that before. If not, there you go. Uh, but anything else, any other post-game wrap-up show that I would be missing would be for uh would be for a conflict with my other job with the U of L stuff. Um so one thing I'm hoping for is that can come back on Sunday afternoon and watch the recorded version of the game and even college game day, knowing that Indiana got the big win against the Huskies, the national the reigning national runner up. Because if they lose, I'll still watch the game and see how things played out. But it, I'm not going to want to watch game day at that point because that would feel so icky knowing that your team lost and they got super hyped up and all that type of stuff. And I'm not expecting Indiana to lose. And I think, I think I said earlier this week and maybe last week as well, that that the way that they handled Nebraska was enough for me to fully dive into the statement of there's no reason that Indiana should not go at the very least 11 and one they have they have that level of talent and potential and coaching on this team to where that is a legitimate expectation at this point because and not that doesn't mean that they have to or it's a failure because teams slip up all the time I and mean, when you're going to have something different this week you have a backup quarterback who i believe is very capable just like kurt signetti believes but that doesn't mean that things are always going to go the way that you you know, that you plan on them going. So we'll see. Don't want to keep dwelling on that stuff too much either, but it's, it's going to be exciting seeing this continue to move forward. And um, I think there are plenty of clear skies ahead, right? When it comes to this Indiana football program, we've also got the charity exhibition that I mentioned on Sunday. And I believe Kyler Staley is going to be on that for us. Uh, if I have time, I know I'm going to be rewatching the football game on Sunday, but I'd love to check out uh, the entirety of the charity exhibition scrimmage as well. If not, I will definitely just take a look at what happened, the short version of the game, that type of thing. But I'm really, I part of me, I, I know I've mentioned this before as well, but part of me is extremely nervous that they are not going to put in a performance that is up to what fans expect. And if that is the case, that yes, it very well could be an indicator that there are some issues that Indiana will need to work out throughout the season. But at the same time, like I said with Kyler a couple of weeks ago, like these types of games are they're they're breeding grounds for overreacting, right? <laughs> that may have been a weird way to phrase it. But that's just the way that I think about it. Whether you kill them, get killed or you, you play a competitive game. There's going to be things that we nitpick at this Indiana basketball team regardless. I, at the very least, regardless of result, and again, the result technically doesn't matter because of, you know, it doesn't go against your record or any of that thing. The, the biggest thing that it does for you is give you reason to be either more excited or less about, or less excited about the season that's coming up because you're going against a team that you are supposed to be fairly, you know, competitive with in general, just when it comes to preseason expectations. Now, Indiana going on the road in Knoxville, I don't know what the environment's going to be like for an exhibition game, 
but it is a team that is expected to be good. So there may be a decent amount of people in attendance for said game. But either way, it's a road environment. I don't think Indiana fans should expect Indiana to just go in and take care of business. I think, and if that happens, this, I'm not saying that that cannot happen because maybe it is. I do think Indiana has the talent that if it's if it meshes together well early in the season, then maybe you can blow out a team like Tennessee on the road. I don't know exactly, but I think at the very least, Indiana should very well be competitive in this game and maybe win a close one, maybe lose a close one. I think the nightmare scenario here is that the the wheels fall off early and Tennessee just runs you out of the gym. Nobody wants to see that, whether it's an exhibition game or not. Uh, and that would give, and then that that's the fear that I have when it comes to, uh, you know, perception and expectation going into the rest of the season because. I mean, that's people are already nervous because this is Mike Woodson's fourth season with the third year being a major disappointment for many based on what happened the first two years. And this is a big prove a year for Mike Woodson with all of the transfer portal talent that he had coming in or has coming in, I should say. And, you know, we're not really relying on on the young, the underclassmen as much. One of the biggest criticisms over the offseason was how he doesn't seem to prioritize freshmen the way that he should, especially those in the state of Indiana. I do think he he did as as good as he w- could have without getting all of the commitments that he wanted by prioritizing guys over this offseason like Malachi Moreno and Braylon Mullins. You missed both of those, unfortunately, but you did get Trent Sisley. And there are still some guys on the table like Bryson Tiller and uh, I believe there's one more whose name I'm not uh, – recalling right now maybe I'm wrong but this is a big year and we'll find out we'll find out early if Mike Woodson's up for the pressure and delivering with results that fans expect because on paper you put together a roster that should be competing near the top of the conference you should comfortably get into the NCAA tournament and if you can check both of those boxes you're safe if you're Mike Woodson and then the, there's a third box that a lot of people put a lot of stock into this third box, and I understand why, but it's making a deep NCAA tournament run. And there is some truth to, you know, certain coaches just can't get it done in March. A lot of people used to reference Matt Painter before last year that he could never get it done in March with Purdue. Well, he finally put together the run that Purdue fans were clamoring for for so long and got all the way to where they should have which was the NCAA championship game and losing to eventual back-to-back champion UConn so I I I don't I don't think I put as much stock into the certain coaches can't get it done I do think there is some truth to it I mean another outlier though is it's Tony Bennett and I know he's no longer going to be with with Virginia but he had his I don't even want to call it a miracle run because it was a good team he had with Virginia in, what is it, 2016, 2017 that he won with. But every other year after that, he couldn't get past the first round. There's just certain coaches that are built for March and they, like they, it's almost like they put all of their effort into having a good run, whereas other coaches do better at the regular season. It is a very interesting case study. But I think one box that would be checked off for Indiana in this scenario is make it back to the second weekend. And I know, and I'm somebody who's also in this camp, I would love to see them get further than just the Sweet 16 just because they haven't been further than that in, what, 22 years? The same year they went to the uh, national championship game in 2002, I believe, was also, also their most recent Elite Eight. If I'm wrong, you're welcome to correct me. But I do believe that's the case. So it's been a long time since... Indian has really been knocking on the door of a final four and not that again, I guess this kind of brings everything full circle, excuse me, full circle. I don't think this has to be a final four team, but I do think if the pieces mesh well and Mike Woodson ends up being the coach that I don't want to say he can, because we don't know whether or not he can be this or not, but if he ends up being what Indiana fans hope and expect, I guess, then that this is probably a team that 
can go to the final four if all of the pieces mesh well together, if Mike Woodson's up to the challenge of being a good head coach. And uh, that's that's where we're at. We're, we're on the cusp of basketball season. We've got Tennessee coming up this Sunday for the charity exhibition, and I'm sure we'll be overreacting to everything that happens on Monday. And I just hope it's a good kind of overreacting. I'd much rather come in here on Monday and talk about how Indiana went to Knoxville and won by 20 than the alternative, which is they look lackluster and they get the doors blown off of them on the road and they look like they have some work to do as the season rears its head. So we'll see. There's no telling what's going to happen. I just hope it's good news and hopefully it's good news for football as well. A uh, couple of other notes. I'm going to bring on Drew Rosenberg here in just a moment, but I want to go over a couple more things real quick when it comes to football that I hadn't mentioned yet. EJ Williams, this happened. I believe I could have done this on Wednesday's show had I seen it early enough, but I happened to miss it after I already published the show. But EJ Williams, another wide receiver for Indiana football, no longer with the program. That is the second wide receiver this year to decide that they are no longer going to be with the team and take that red shirt year to maintain that eligibility. And, uh, becomes the second player after Donovan McCulley to do that. And I get it. Uh, you know, it probably makes some fans upset. Maybe not as upset if they as they would be if the team wasn't doing well. But um, both Williams and McCulley just weren't able to, you know, find the the snaps on the field that they had been getting previously, getting over injuries and the like, that sort of thing. So I don't blame them at all in this world of, you know, where the players have all the power. It makes total sense for them to want to maintain their eligibility and enter into the transfer portal this offseason and try to have one last good run at a different program. So I wish both EJ Williams and Donovan McCulley well. I know Donovan McCulley's was a couple of weeks ago, I believe. Uh, but, you know, it's a shame. It's a shame that they weren't able to, you know, to maintain how well they were doing here at Indiana and then the, that they're going to have to take it elsewhere. So uh, shout out to them, I guess, if that is a shout out. And then John Gruden, we talked about Kyle Schwarber going to be the guest picker, but John Gruden going to be in Bloomington for game day this weekend. So, And he's invited people to come hang out with him. I don't really know how many people are going to be able to get around one John Gruden, but, you know, if that's something that interests you, have a, you know, be looking around Memorial Stadium for, for Mr. Gruden. And uh, speaking of Memorial Stadium, happy hour returns for the concession stand, which means before – the game actually starts. The concessions will be open between 1030 and 1130 a.m. So if you want to get uh, the party started a little early when it comes to getting your game day fix from whatever is offered in M Memorial Stadium, you can do that with happy hour concessions from 1030 to 1130. That is not an advertisement, even if it did sound like one. Just wanted to mention it for those who will be in attendance at this weekend's game at Memorial Stadium. So. We'll uh, we'll get into some more football stuff, and uh, after this segment with Drew Rosenberg, going to get into uh, my games and bets of the week. I might do things a little bit different with the way that I present it, because uh, I've already made my picks as usual. I've got a couple of different parlays. I think I'm going to go through the my parlays first before I get into the rest of the games, just so I'm, you know, it just seems like it might be a better way to go about. Uh, presenting it we'll give that a try and then i got a few other things i want to go over as well but we're going to do a little nba discussion right now with who's illustrated.com's drew rosenberg and he again as i mentioned at the beginning of the show he knows his stuff and uh he's excited about a brand new nba season so let's turn it over to mr rosenberg right making now. his second appearance on in touch with indiana sports it is the one the only drew rosenberg of who's illustrated.com and the talking about the hoosiers podcast Glad to have you back here on a Friday, Drew. Yeah, it's good to be back. You know, a lot to talk about. I'm looking forward to getting into it. And we're gonna we're gonna do something a little bit different this time. On this show so far, we haven't done a lot of NBA discussion, but as many of you are probably aware, the NBA tipped off back on it was Wednesday, correct? It was Wednesday. Uh, Today's Friday. I'm getting Tuesday. all my days mixed up. It was Tuesday. Yeah, you had the two openers. That included LeBron and Bronny with the Lakers and all that stuff. And you had the Pacers get things rolling on a Wednesday. And, you know, things are getting in full swing. So we're going to try something a little bit different here today. Just kind of see how it goes. I'll, I'll be the first to confess, Drew. I am not the biggest NBA guy. Now, one thing that I did last spring and that was fun to keep an eye on was seeing the Pacers really just kind of, you know, 
defy all odds, if you will, mm -hmm. and make a run all the way to the Eastern Conference Finals. And unfortunately, things did not go their way, but it was still a fun ride to be on my buddies Mitchell and Dustin, who many of you have probably seen on this mm -hmm. show. They both attended a couple, at least one or two playoff games for the for the Indiana Pacers. So I know that there are Pacers fans out there. I just may not be one of the bigger ones in mind. Yeah, their run last year, I mean, that offense, you watch them play at Tyrese Halliburton. I like to use the word an engine. He there's very few guys in the league you look and they you can call them an engine as they dictate an entire offense. I use that category for the Luka Doncic's, the James Harden's, the Nikola Jokic's, even a guy like Giannis, unbelievable player, two time MVP, not an engine. Tyrese Halliburton has the makings of an engine, and we see it time and time again. He can dictate the offense, create open looks consistently for guys. And even when he's not scoring, like the, um, in the Pacers win, blanking who you guys beat. I know, um, I think it was. Oh, they, the oh, they took down the Pistons. It was Pistons. Yeah. Uh, Halliburton played, did not shoot the ball well, but did everything else well, and then hit a big shot at the end. He's just one of those guys you can rely on big moments to make plays. Let me ask you real quick. So if you yourself are not a Pacers guy, are you just kind of an all-around NBA guy? Do you have a specific team, or or who is it that you really pay attention to when it comes to the NBA? I'm going to get uh, – I get a lot of hate for this, especially from Kyler. And uh, it's uh, I'm a Celtics fan. I I'm gro uh, grew up in Boston. <laughs> I mean, it's – Oh, that's – I mean, why game. would you get heat from that? I mean, especially yeah. if you have, you know, regional ties to the Celtics. I mean, I mean, thankfully, right now you're living in an era where yeah. they're as good as they've been for a long time. Yeah. I've, uh, I've lucked out with the last couple of years, especially, I mean, last year winning a championship. I mean, I am a Celtics fan, but I am an all, like, just an NBA guy in general. I mean, I'm not just watching the Celtics, like, last yeah. night. I, you know, obviously watching the football game, but also have Thunder Nuggets, Mavericks Spurs on as I'm watching all the other games, just kind of keeping an eye on what's going on in the NBA. Well, let me ask you this, then, since you are a Celtics fan. What do you think, and I'm sure many people would be in the boat of thinking that the Boston Celtics have a do or do have a really good chance to repeat this year. Who would you say, would you say that that is the case or do you think that there are other teams who will maybe pull through and win the NBA championship? I think uh, you look at the NBA the last, I think eight years since golden state won in 2018, there's been a lot of parody, which is great for the league. There hasn't been a back-to-back -back champion since those Kevin Durant warriors. But I do think when you look at the rosters, the Celtics are the team best positioned to go back to back since those Warriors. They brought back their entire top of the rotation from last year, did not lose any key pieces. And how often that happens in the NBA, a team wins a championship and returns their entire core. That just does not happen. So I do think they're in a very, very strong position to go back to back. But there is a lot of teams that got better. The New York Knicks are the obvious choice, adding Kale Bridges and Carl Anthony Towns could easily. I mean, we saw they lost by 20 to Celtics opening night, but Celtics shot hit 29 threes. So that, you know, that's not going to happen every game. I also want to talk about the Thunder. Thunder just beat the Nuggets. You know, Chet Holmgren looks better. The Nuggets are, or the Thunder are so young that they're just keep getting better. But they also added Alex Caruso, Isaiah Hartenstein. So those are a couple of teams I think could knock off the Celtics, even the Timberwolves too. Timberwolves, I know they lost Carl Anthony Towns, but uh, Julius Randle, Dante DiVincenzo, their depth is very good, and Anthony Edwards is a rising superstar. How do you feel about the Pacers being potentially in that conversation as well in the East? Because and, and obviously you've got uh, the rematch between the Knicks tonight at 7.30 on ESPN for those who are interested. And um, do you think that the Pacers, with, with whatever with whatever they were able to retain over the, over the offseason coming into this year, do you think that they're, they'll be able to make a run similar to what they did last spring? I think last year the Pacers did benefit a little bit with some of the injuries in the East. I think they, you know, I think last year they were a little ahead of timeline. It, um, it kind of reminds me of the Celtics when they, um, Tatum's rookie year when they made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. That team should not have made it to the Eastern Conference Finals, and it kind of sped up the timeline and put a little more pressure on them. Yeah. And I think it's similar with the Pacers. I think the Pacers, you know, they're a young core, Tyrese Halliburton, Ben Matherin, uh, Turner's getting a little older, but I mean, Pascal Siakam, they're a very talented team. And if they hadn't made the Eastern Conference Finals last year, they'd be in a position where you're looking like, okay, this is a team that's going to keep getting better and eventually push the, you know, win the East. But because of last year, now there is these expectations on them. And I think the biggest thing for them, it's they got to improve on the defensive end. Last year, I think they were the second best offense in the league. And they have all the offensive talent with Tyrese Halliburton, Siakam, Miles Turner is a great rim protector. 
but they need to improve a little bit on the defensive side. Aaron Neesmith, uh, Nemhard, both very good defenders, but the team defense does need to improve. And they play fast, which makes it a little harder for them to, you know, keep teams away from scoring because just the pace they play. But that's also one of their biggest advantages because teams aren't used to how quick they pay, play and how fast they get up and down the court. So there's more possessions. And keeping up the Pacers, it's difficult. I mean, Celtics might have swept them last year, but if you watch the games, it was probably their toughest series in the playoffs. Yeah. Who are um, who are some of the sleeper teams? Maybe not necessarily to, to win the entire thing, but who do you expect to take a big step forward this year in the NBA? I think the – a couple come to mind. I want to first. I want to talk about the Grizzlies. Um, last year, missed the playoffs. Just you know, Zach Ed added, but not even about that. It's about John Morant's healthy. Get a full season, of John Morant. The last time we saw a healthy John Morant, the Grizzlies were top of the West. So I, I'm not calling them a sleeper. I just want they are going to be back on the map. But um, Pelicans added Dejounte Murray, but he looks like he fractured his hand, so he could be out a while. But If Zion Williamson can stay healthy, they can make some noise out West. But the two teams I really kind of label as sleepers are the Orlando Magic and the uh, San Antonio Spurs. Magic, I'll start with them first. Yeah, they were a five seed loss in the first round, but Paulo Bancaro is legit. Franz Wagner is very good as well. Those guys, I expect them to take another step. And I think Paulo is now third year and Franz is fourth year. Two guys who are, you know, fringe all-stars could take that leap to all NBA. Both guys have that potential. And there are so many defensive guards in that team. They play really good defense, and if those guys can take that leap, it could be very good. And then the Spurs just – I'm really interested to see how – I guess how they work together. Last night they lost by 11 to the Mavericks, but Wembenyama probably played one of his worst games of his career. I mean, Wembenyama has – you know, rookie year he did everything he could to live up to the, you know, unreal expectations that he has. He has impossible expectations, and somehow he – as a rookie, he reached them. He's going to probably win a bunch of defensive players of the year. And just seeing how he fits with Chris Paul, Harrison Barnes, those additions, in addition with a Jeremy Sohan, Kelvin Johnson, Devin Vassell, I'm very interested to see kind of how the Spurs are. And they still have Greg Popovich, who is, you know, he doesn't get It's the- like he's a, he's a piece of – he's a relic at this point. Yeah. And not, not, that's not meant to be an insult, but I can't believe that he's still coaching, if we're being honest. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is because of Wembenyama. I honestly would have thought he would have retired by now. And then I think, you know, they land the the number one pick in the biggest draft lottery since probably LeBron James landing Wembenyama. Yeah. It's like, all right, now Popovich goes from, you know, he got this coach Tim Duncan, Duncan, um, David Robinson, those guys. Now he gets the next best uh, big prospect to come out since then, probably in Wembenyama. So I think that was, you know, big motivation for him to stay and, I saw a stat last night in the first, I think it was first 30 years of the Spurs organization. They missed the playoffs five times. They've missed it four times in the last five years. So that organization does not lose a lot. And I think with Wampanyama, they're going to get back to their winning ways sooner than later. And I want to ask you from the IU side of things, what do you expect out of rookie Kalel Ware this year? Do you think he's going to make a big impact for the Heat or do you think he's just kind of be there in the background? What do you expect out of him? So I've been very open. I'm very high on Khalil Ware and his ability to make an impact in the NBA. I think, you know, coming into the draft process, I said the worst case scenario for him was he's a, a very good weak side rim protector, which is super valuable in today's NBA. But he's shown he can shoot the three ball. He's got to improve a little bit, putting the ball on the floor a little bit. But he is someone that I think can play alongside Bam and Abayo. I think the Heat was like a perfect fit for him just developmental-wise. But getting him on the floor, I mean, he – barely played in the opening night. He was great in the preseason, great in the G League or the um, summer league. So I think he will get an opportunity. It's just a matter of when, not if. And I don't know how long just because the Heat are a team that, you know, they may not have made the might not have made the biggest acquisitions, but they did go to the finals two years ago. So they're a team that's trying to win and, you know, getting a rookie into the fold of things of a team like that, it's not easy as we saw with Jalen Hutchifina last year in the Lakers. Yeah. And one thing I want to – I was going to initially start the segment with this, but I think this is as good a time as any, I guess, to bring it up. But the kind of the biggest story of the week was, at least in the NBA, was LeBron James and Bronny James being on the floor at the same time. How do you feel about that entire – just kind of the way that that whole thing played out? Because a lot of people thought that there was no reason for Bronny James to be drafted in the first place. Of course, when you have somebody like LeBron James really being the face of your organization, and really, even though he's not fully what he used to be, he still is kind of the face of the NBA. 
And when he has the pull that he has, I mean, there's no reason to doubt that he didn't have everything to do with why Bronny ended up getting drafted late in the second round to the Lakers, simply to have these moments like you saw on opening night of the NBA. And I, I, I'll go start real quick with what I thought. So I initially thought that it was, it was nonsense, as many people probably did. But one thing that I heard somebody mention the other day that I thought was, was genius way of thinking, like why it would make sense for the Lakers to do this. If you want to give LeBron James, somebody who is in their late 30s, almost 40 years old, a reason to compete once again, it is by you know doing exactly what they did. Bring his son onto the team. Give him that extra reason to maybe prep a little harder than he was going to without him. And even though you're not really going to get much out of Bronny James specifically, maybe this just enhances what time you have left with the king, LeBron James himself. Yeah, uh, I think that's, you know, it's – that's kind of been something that's kind of gone under the radar, I think. And I compare it to uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo and his brother, Tenasis. Tenasis is a, like, not a bad, like, he's not the best player in the world. I mean, you've seen, there's the low lights everywhere about how he's, you know, people call him the worst player in the NBA. I'm not going to go that far, but what Tenasis really brings is his energy on the bench. He's a guy that's there for Giannis because Giannis is away from his family, who's a lot of his family's in Greece. So it's for him a connection back home and like having that family around. It helps Giannis and helps him mentally. And it's why the Bucks continue to re-sign him year after year. And I think that's Bronny's gonna have a similar effect on LeBron. You know, LeBron's year 22 now. So for him, it's like how much longer does he want to play? He's accomplished everything you could ever want to accomplish in basketball. He's the all-time leading scorer, four championships, MVPs after MVPs. It's been to 10 plus finals. So having, you know, his son be able to go through the process with him, I think that helps LeBron on his own just like the mental side of the game, which, you know, kind of gets up overlooked a lot of times when you think about basketball, the mental side is really important there, but like on the court, I think it's no secret saying Bronny is not ready to play in the NBA. I'm not saying he won't ever be Bronny is, you know, I see the vision. He can be a guy like I compared to like Alex Crusoe, like a pretty good defender can shoot the three ball, but people kind of are overlooking the fact Bronny had, you know, a, um, huge heart issue less than a year ago like or i guess a little over a year ago now you know Bronny, you know needed pretty much to be like needed cpr on the court pretty much and most players you know if he wasn't lebron james son he probably doesn't enter the draft he probably gets another year at usc to like build up off that and i think we kind of overlooked that and i do think Bronny should have took another year in college but i think with lebron being there knowing that he's going to have a spot in the lakers and the lakers are going to do what they can to develop him it did make a lot of sense for him to go to the nba and while i don't think he's ready yet and i think it's a hard situation because they want to talk about sending him to the g league the g league is full of the best college like former you know college studs luka garza uh he's in the nba now but he was the guy killing in the g league last year so it's going to be a tough, like, how do you develop him? Because clearly he's not really ready to play in the NBA, but then you throw him to the G League, and I don't think he's good enough yet to dominate in the G League like you'd want a guy who you're trying to develop. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to follow along with because even though it does kind of suck that, yeah, because of the whole LeBron circumstances, you did take away a draft pick that probably otherwise would have gone to somebody else. Yeah, But at the same time, he is going to, now that he's with the Lakers and, you know, with somebody in the NBA, even if he doesn't pan out to be maybe exactly what he wants to be, he's still going to have the best of the best training with him at this point. And maybe that will play to his advantage. And maybe he ends up making the most of it, a, you know, a year or two down the line. And maybe he's making an impact for maybe not the Lakers, but for a different team, potentially something like that. So just wanted to bring that up because I know that, yeah. I mean, that was one of the biggest talking points over the offseason in general, I feel like, just because. Everybody was, and this is me included, we're talking about the nonsense that, you know, that's all that's coming with Bronny James getting drafted and all the drama that comes with LeBron. Cause it feels like you can't mention LeBron James and not have a little bit of drama involved with it, right? So, uh, let's see. Any, anywhere else I want to go with, with the NBA? Well, I guess just anything, anything else like, in general that you're excited about with the upcoming season. And I know one thing last year too, if you, you don't have to comment on this, if you don't want to, but the in season tournament was mm -hmm. something that was new and the Pacers did really well in that. But what's just something that you're looking forward to about the season in general? I think uh, you mentioned that the NBA cup, the in season tournament, I, you know, was very kind of critical of it 
when it was first brought up. I liked the concept, but my whole thinking was, you know, players aren't really trying in the regular season. Is this really going to get them to try thinking, you know, they're making so much money. Is the $500,000 really going to, you know, get them to try that much harder? And I was very, you know, I was pleasantly surprised it did. It was awesome last year. I know Pacers fans probably loved it. You know, the Lakers ended up winning the whole thing over the Pacers, but I thought it was such a cool concept because it got people tuning in to the NBA in November, December, when usually that's all football time, no in college yeah. basketball. No one really, you know, typically like tuning into the NBA that early in the year does not happen for the, you know, common fans. So the in-season tournament was a great way to do that. And, you know, it's similar to like I compare it to like European soccer. Those uh, leagues, they have their, you know, their main league, they have their tournaments, they have like yeah. different competitions. So it was cool to see the players have, you know, something else to play for that early in the season. Good stuff. Drew, I appreciate you as always. And we'll we'll do this more frequently now that the NBA is getting in full swing and uh, appreciate your time. And also thanks once again for doing some post-game wrap-up stuff for me this upcoming weekend. You and Dylan. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, we'll be on the Hoosier Illustrated YouTube channel um, immediately, or I think immediately after the press conferences finish from the uh, players and coaches, me and Dylan are going to hop on and talk about it. all things IU football, Washington, our reaction, Taven Jackson, how he looks, any updates on Curtis Rourke that we hear, anything like that. We're going to have it all on uh, Hoosier Illustrated's YouTube. Gosh, and, I'm, and you, you know I'm big IU football guy, and, and you, you and I were, were, you know, me, you, and Kyler did the – the Indiana football preview and Indiana's only one went away from the eight and four that both yeah. Kyler and I predicted. And now that just seems like nonsense at this mm -hmm. point. So we'll yeah. leave it at that. Drew, appreciate your time. We'll, we'll do this again sometime. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Big thank you to Drew Rosenberg and all that he had to offer when it comes to his NBA expertise. And we will be checking in with him more regularly when it comes to all things that are going on with the association. Before we get into our bets and picks of the week i do want to talk about a game that took place last night and not really about the game itself but more about what happened with the specific player during that game and that game first of all was syracuse at pittsburgh and pittsburgh completely uh dominated and now that i say that again i'm having one of those, one of those moments where so i didn't watch the entirety of the game and i'm starting to think that okay was that closer than i remember no pittsburgh did dominate and it was 41 to 13 but at halftime it was 31 to nothing and Kyle McCord the former ohio state quarterback he threw three pick sixes in the first half and ended up throwing five total interceptions on the day you know for the entirety of the game that's just unheard of. That is insane. And for somebody who used to be the quarterback at Ohio State, that's just crazy to think about. And I just wanted to mention that game right there in case anybody was able to keep an eye on that at all or saw any of the highlights from that because three pick sixes. Somebody in a, a Big Ten group chat that I'm in had mentioned that they do know of a worse scenario. And it was back, it, it involved Illinois. I don't remember what year it was, but their quarterback for a particular game, it was a backup quarterback. Uh, dude, I think believe the starter was injured, but the backup quarter of a quarterback for that that particular game against Arizona threw three pick sixes in the first quarter, not just the first half, the first quarter. So insane stuff in college football. That's why you love it. It's why you hate it. Um, hopefully, at least if you're an Indiana fan, you're loving it for now. But Let's go. I'm going to go ahead and share some of my, a couple of my parlays for the weekend. And I know some of you, this isn't always your cup of tea. That's fine. I love doing it. This is more for me than anything else. And if you, it's, and I say more for me, it's not just for me to just spew out into the ether. I do like to share what I'm betting on because it's fun. And if you like, if you're somebody who enjoys it as well, you can, as always, tail me or you can fade me, whatever you believe is more likely to happen. So let me go ahead and share my first. So I've got two parlays. One of them is just kind of typically what I always do. I take some spreads or overs and, you know, you just hope you hope it hits. And it's all of this is based on, you know, who I think is going to win. It's not just random. And then I've got a more risky parlay. It's not for the faint of heart. It's more uh, it's kind of an upset city type of parlay. So we'll do that one second and I'll let you know what those, each of those are. So first up, I've got. Ohio State minus 25 and a half against Nebraska. 
And the reason I think Ohio State's going to cover that spread, it's not because I think Nebraska is terrible or anything like that. Maybe they are terrible. We'll find out. But I think Ohio State, especially coming off their bye week, coming off that loss to Oregon, they're going to see what Indiana did against Nebraska, and they're going to want to do that and then some if they're able to. So I think Ohio State finds a way, especially with it being at home, I think they're going to find a way to cover that 25 and a half and maybe win by a similar score in which Indiana was able to against the Cornhuskers. So we'll see if that ends up playing out. I'm pretty confident in that one, but that's my first leg of the first parlay. Second leg, staying in the Big Ten. Excuse me, I'm going to mute my microphone so I don't cough in all of your faces real quick. Hate doing that. But uh, it is that time of year, as I've mentioned. That's why I've got my coffee with me. Trying to keep my throat clear as often as possible. But I, for one, even though I love the fall, I do not like the allergies that come with the changing of the season for myself. All right. I think we're back in terms of uh, getting the train rolling again with the voice. Anyway, I'm taking Illinois plus 21 and a half against Oregon on the road. For some reason, Illinois, even though they keep putting together really good results, they've done it all season long, even when they've lost, they're always competitive. And Oregon, on the other hand, yeah, they're undefeated. Yeah, they have a big win against Ohio State, but there have been times where they kind of play to their competition a little bit. And not that this would necessarily be them playing down to Illinois, But I just don't see them blowing the doors off of the Illini because, I mean, Oregon, have they killed, other than Purdue, who have they really destroyed this season, right? Because they had close games against Idaho, Boise State. Uh, And again, Boise State's a good team as well, but Idaho is not, at least when it comes to the fact that it's an FCS team. But I think Illinois will keep this within three touchdowns. Again, I'm very confident in that as well. I think Illinois will be very competitive in this game. I don't think they'll win, but... I mean, when Illinois went on the road to Penn State, a lot of people thought they were going to get blown out there, and that was a very competitive game there, too. So uh, very confident in Illinois, plus 21 and a half for the second leg of the parlay. The final leg of the first parlay here, I'm taking the over in Miami versus Florida State. The over, at least when I got it, was 54 and a half. And I believe Miami there's a chance they could get 54 by themselves, even without help from Florida State. So, again, all three of these picks that I'm sharing, I'm very confident in. So, if you want to tell me, and you, you know, when we hit props to you, we are due for a college football parlay hit. And this one I'm very confident in. So, uh, and some of you may be asking, why aren't we throwing Indiana in the parlay this week? Usually you're pretty confident in Indiana because they've been going against the spread this week. There's one reason and one reason only I'm not betting on Indiana, and it's the wild card of Taven Jackson. And I know earlier this week, I kind of went on a little bit of a rant talking about like, oh, people shouldn't be mentioning Taven Jackson being that big of a difference for Indiana. And and while I do agree with that, I do think Taven will come in and perform well. There is, in terms of betting on it, I don't. I would rather my parlay not be messed up because of something different with Indiana this week. I'd rather take something that I can be, you know, I feel more confident in with the legs, right? Um, and again, yeah, I don't want it to seem like I'm doubting the Hoosiers because I am confident in the Hoosiers, but not wanting to put the put money next to it this weekend, right? Um, but if you're wanting to bet on Indiana and it hits, props to you for being more confident than myself. All right, I'm going to share my, this is my high-risk parlay. This is the Upset City parlay. And one of these, I'll go ahead and start with the one that's technically, according to Vegas, not really an upset. And that is UCF minus one and a half against BYU. And the reason I say it's technically not upset is clearly because UCF's favored. But BYU, they're 7-0. and This would be, this would be, by definition, an upset when it comes to who, who should, in fact, win this game. But Vegas, much like myself, of course, thinks this is going to be the end of the line for unbeaten BYU. And not the end of the line for their season being over, of course, but just the, the end of them being undefeated for the remainder of the year. So, And I'm confident in that as well. That's why the first leg of my upset parlay is UCF minus one and a half. 
UCF three and four, by the way. They only have a winning record, but they've had a lot of close games. And so is BYU. I think that's a lot of reason why BYU is also not favored in this game is because a lot of their wins have been close wins. They nearly lost to Iowa State, or not Iowa State, nearly lost to, um, heck, no, was it Oklahoma State this past week? Either way. Iowa State nearly lost to UCF last week is what I was trying to mention. But anyway, it's the first leg of the upset parlay. Next one. I'm taking, where's my Big Ten list? I have it on here. Just wanted to make sure I had it pulled up so I could reference it correctly. Oh, I know, I know who they're playing. We've got, I'm taking Wisconsin money line at home against number three, Penn State. Same situation right here. I think this is a case of Penn State being overdue for a loss with the, against a Wisconsin team that has about as much momentum as you could expect them to have right now, considering things looked very bleak for the Wisconsin football team when they lost Tyler Van Dyke during that Alabama game. And uh, they they bounced back very well in a lot of the games since then. They destroyed Purdue. They destroyed uh, Rutgers. I can't believe I can't remember all their games, but I think Wisconsin is primed for a home upset against the number three ranked team, Penn State, Disney Lions, and um, that's why I'm taking Wisconsin not just to cover six and a half. I'm taking them to outright win at home and hand the Nittany Lions their first loss on the year. Excuse me. And then my final leg of the upset parlay is we're, we're betting on the service academy again, folks. We're taking Navy money line against number 12 Notre Dame. They're, they're, they're underdogs by 13 and a half points. And some of you may wonder, why not just take the take them to cover, John? Why you got to be so risky and flat out bet on them to win? Well, it's because Notre Dame's already shown that in, against funky teams – like Navy, I don't think Marcus Freeman is going to have them prepared for that military academy style of offense that can be so confusing for certain teams. And this is without a doubt whether they'll say it or not. I mean, I know the Navy Army game is kind of their Super Bowl each and every year, but in terms of having a chance to maybe be the G5 team to make the playoff, this is the next step in doing that if you're Navy. And there's a huge opportunity ahead of them. I'm sure they believe that they can win because they've been so dominant in all of their games up to this point. And Notre Dame's at times looks kind of shaky. Now, they have bounced back fairly well since their loss to Northern Illinois, but they still have it, though. It still shows you that there are cracks in, in teams with elite players like Notre Dame just because not everything always fits the way that you want it to. And I think Navy is going to take advantage of some good situations this, this week. And I'm taking Navy to flat out win against the Irish for the final leg of my money line upset parlay. I guess technically UCF minus one and a half is a money line, but it is what it is. That's what we're taking when it comes to bets this weekend. If you want to tail me, do it. If you want to fade me, do it. Hopefully I'm back on Monday to report that we've got some, uh, some big hits from the weekend, but We'll have to wait and see. Uh, let's take a look at a few of the other games going on this weekend. I'll share my thoughts from around the Big Ten and maybe some other of the top 25 matchups as well. But first up tonight, we've got Rutgers at USC at 11 p.m. on Fox. If you're somebody who is planning on staying up to watch Rutgers and USC, there's probably only a few people that fit into that group. It's probably Rutgers fans. It's USC fans, and it's people a part of the Sickos committee that we refer that we reference every now and then. Because if you're staying up watching Rutgers USC at 11 p.m., that game ain't in until at least two, three in the morning. Uh, so if you want to party on a Friday night and get your college football weekend started, check out Rutgers USC. USC is currently favored by nearly two touchdowns, and both of these teams are really desperate for a you know, to get their season back on the right track with a win after a few disappointing weekends. And USC in particular, I think they need this more than Rutgers needs it. So I'll predict USC to win here. I don't know how pretty or ugly it'll be, but I think the Trojans end up getting it done to get back to 500 against the Scarlet Knights. We've already talked Nebraska, Ohio State. We talked plenty about Washington and Indiana this week. 
And of course, we already talked about Illinois and Oregon. So that knocks out a few Big Ten games. And we also talked Penn State and Wisconsin. That's a little bit later on down the uh, the list here. So we've got three more Big Ten games to share thoughts on real quick. We've got Northwestern at Iowa. Iowa was looking like a promising team, and not that they're uh, not that they're not a good team, as good of a team as we thought, but they kind of got humbled a little bit last weekend on the road at Michigan State. And, uh, of course, that bodes well for Indiana when it comes to when you play Michigan State, playing against a better caliber opponent than maybe you thought. But Iowa, before that, was looking like maybe the best of the second-tier Big Ten teams, the way that they dismantled Washington 40-16 to a couple of weeks ago. But uh, they got humbled last week, and they're going to get a chance to rebound at home against Northwestern. And I think Northwestern, even though they had a, a, a bit of a decent run there, of getting some momentum, uh, got a big win against Maryland. They got humbled last week against Wisconsin, a very um, a Wisconsin team with a lot of momentum right now. But I think Iowa bounces back in a big way this week by taking down the Wildcats on their home field, Kinnick Stadium. Maryland at Minnesota. Maryland team coming off their big win against USC. Now goes on the road, take on PJ Flex, Golden Gophers. How do I feel about this one? These are two very kind of confusing teams in the Big Ten. Maryland, at times, looks like they can be really competitive with the best teams, but also they look like they don't belong on the same field with some of them whenever it comes. They're just a very inconsistent team, and Minnesota could say the same about them. They got up for some of their big games. They kind of struggled against UCLA on the road. Uh, but they are they have won back to back games against the California schools, USC and then UCLA. So there's two teams kind of coming in with some momentum, trying to find their footing as maybe one of the better teams in the middle of the pack of the Big Ten. And for some reason, I'm thinking Maryland's going to win this game, even though it's on the road. Of course, not betting on it. I've already shared my picks with you. But don't be surprised if you see Maryland go into Huntington Bank Stadium this weekend and leave with a W. I just kind of have a weird feeling that Loxley's going to have his team ready to go and that we're going to see another P.J. Fleck let down after winning two in a row. And then finally, the nightcap in the Big Ten, Michigan State at Michigan. Is this the battle for Paul Bunyan's axe? I know there's a couple of different Paul Bunyan type of trophies, uh, and this is one of them. I don't know ex exactly with the name for sure for this iteration of Paul Bunyan. But I'll tell you what, this is a good opportunity for Michigan State to really take a big step in terms of momentum before they face Indiana. I know they just got that big win on, at home against Iowa that I mentioned earlier, but if they can go on the road in the big house and defeat a struggling Michigan team who can't find offense to save its life, then Indiana will most certainly have a tough task on their hands when they go into Spartan Stadium next week against a team that if they do win this weekend they'll have won I believe it's at least two in a row let me see if it'd be three games in a row or not no it'd be two in a row for Michigan State if they win this weekend but two important wins they'll be rolling they'll be hyped about a potentially unbeaten Indiana team coming to town if they can take care of Washington this weekend so that's something to really keep an eye on if you're an Indiana fan uh, just because I, I, I've been circling that game as a, kind of a trap for Indiana, especially if Michigan State's really rolling, they're going to be it's going to make that even tougher of an environment if Michigan State is able to put together an upset bid. I mean, would it be an upset? I mean, technically, it would be Michigan's favored by five here at home. But Michigan, what have they showed anybody recently that proves they can put up points against teams? I mean, they keep flip-flopping quarterbacks, and that's not the kind of problem you expect to see from a program like Michigan, who's supposed to be the elite of the elite. So if I were betting on this, I think I would take Michigan State to win, even though it's on the road. Because, again, Michigan, all the problems they're having, I don't think Sharon Moore is the guy to, to kind of navigate these problems. So far, he hasn't really shown that he's up for it. And I think at that point, you start to see if if – Michigan fans aren't doing this already. You're going to start seeing them question whether or not Sharon Moore can get it done as the head coach in Michigan. So we'll see there. That's That does it for the Big Ten games this weekend. Let's see if there's anything else I want to mention when it comes to the rest of the top 25. 
Uh, you know, we already talked about BYU and UCF. Uh, here, here's all the ranked on ranked matchups this week. There's a lot of them going on outside of the ones I've already mentioned. You also have number 21, Missouri, at number 15, Alabama. If Alabama loses, that's the end of the playoff race for them under Kalen DeBoer. And, uh, and I hate to say it's the end of their season, but for in a lot of Alabama's minds, Alabama fans' minds, I should say, if you can't get it done, uh, you know, if you can't get to the playoff, then what are they playing for? I mean, that's when you're the top tier of the SEC and the Big Ten, reg, you know, year in and year out, and you can't find a way to the playoff, then that's probably a failure of a season for you. So that's something to keep an eye on this weekend. Number five, Texas will try to bounce back at number 25, Vanderbilt. It does kind of aggravate me that Vanderbilt's in the top 25 because it just feels like an excuse to give Texas another top 25 victory. I feel like you see this happen in the SEC all the time. Um, but I mean, props to Vanderbilt. They've done what they, you know, could to get here, but they also, they have two crappy losses. Vanderbilt, even though they have a win against number one, Alabama, uh, number one, Alabama, they also have a loss to Georgia state, but at, oh, and it wasn't the road, but I mean, still Georgia state, uh, you did lose to Missouri, which again, at the time wasn't, I mean, it's not really a bad loss in general, but Missouri uh, has taken a couple of dumb losses, or at least has a dumb loss of their own. I believe uh, they got they lose to Texas A and M. Now I'm going down a rabbit hole that I didn't expect to go. Yeah, they lost to Texas A and M. They got killed on the road at Texas A and M. Uh, so that's uh, ranked on ranked. You got number eight LSU at number fourteen Texas A and M. Speak of the devil, um, and you know, am I going to watch it? Probably not. But it is a ranked on ranked matchup in the SEC. If that's something that wets your whistle between the Tigers and the Aggies. So there you go. There's some of your big matchups for the weekend. If you're going to bet on some of those matchups like I am with me, then, you know, good luck to you. Hopefully we can come back celebrating with some extra cash on Monday. And uh, again, be sure to check out this weekend's post-game wrap-up show with Drew Rosenberg and Dylan Traeger taking the reins. And I look forward to being back with you for the rest of the post-game shows um, beginning next week. So. Thanks for sticking around. Look forward to doing this again next week. Be sure to check out everything, as always, going on at HoosierIllustrated.com with all of our great writers. Check out the Talking About the Hoosiers podcast every Thursday. Subscribe to the channel on YouTube. Leave a comment, leave a like, share the show, all that good stuff. And until Monday, I will talk to you on Monday. This has been another episode of In Touch with Indiana Sports, powered by HoosierIllustrated.com.